see people that are giving. Uh, all the giving tonight is going to be going towards blessing the man of God that the Lord has sent to us tonight. Uh, without the faithful, I just want to take a moment and say, without the faithful and consistent giving of this group, we would be unable uh, to bring in men of God like Brother Sanders and uh, Brother Herring and, and, and some others. So thank you for your giving. It does not go to waste. Uh, you can also text to give. We've kind of under used that. If you could throw that slide. Is she sitting there? No, she, she walked away. Uh, you can also text to give. That's a good way to just give five, ten dollars. It does go a long way. But I felt the presence of God in this room from the moment I walked in. I feel that this service was in the destiny of heaven. Somebody was going to get a breakthrough. I've been feeling it all day. I was in my office before, an hour or so before, and the burden just hit me. That there's somebody walking in and you don't realize what you're walking into. You might have not been prepared. You might have not sown the seed into the ground. But the intercessors have sown the seed for you. Amen. And someone, hear me right now, stood in the gap on your behalf. And when you walked in, God had already predetermined that you were going to get a breakthrough. If you would just open your heart and receive it. The man of God that's coming to this pulpit really doesn't need an introduction um he's a a great friend to this church great friend to lifeline he was one of our speakers for our lifeline conference and what a highlight that was amen and what a touch of god he's a friend to many here he's a voice to all and uh, we're just going to open our heart and receive what the man of god has tonight amen amen would you stand tonight would you greet the man of god as he comes amen god bless brother sanders as he comes to minister Why don't we give that hand clap to Jesus? Give him a hand clap that he's worthy of right now. Would you accompany that with an uplifted voice? Oh, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a wonderful atmosphere of the Holy Ghost is here tonight. And I give honor to Pastor Haney and also to... Pastor Morgan Ellis and Pastor Josh Abrego and all of the Lifeline team. We love them. And by special request, my dear beloved friend, Brother Geisler, came over here. And uh, Brother Geisler, you may be wondering why I sent them over to get you. It's just because I feel better when you're in the building. And uh, some of you folks don't understand what a treasure you have in Brother Geisler. And I figured if I'm going to preach to a room full of young people, I'd like to have the presence of an elder in the house. Amen. Good to have Charlie here with me tonight. Good to see all of our... All of our friends in the house, I won't keep you standing very long. We're going to go to the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. And I will begin reading in verse number 15. You've done an incredible job on your gymnasium here, converting it into the Lifeline Sanctuary. Everything looks so nice, and I know that you have, I know that you have saved and given to make this into what it is. And I want to encourage somebody to get into radical giving as led by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's kind of the response I expected. If you will give whatever the Lord puts in your spirit to give, God's not just going to bless you, but he's going to use you to be a blessing. And his kingdom will be pressed forward. The Lord has tremendously poured out revival and harvest in Kerman. And a lot of that goes back to God's people beginning to just give of their time, of their effort, of their finances. And as they gave, the word of the Lord says that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so giving is not just an indicator of the fact that we're thankful that he's provided for us, but it's also an indicator of where our heart is. 
And when you place your heart in what God is doing by placing your finances in what God is doing, He'll put His heart in what you're doing. And He'll put His blessing in what you're doing. And uh, so I want to encourage this Lifeline group. You're the, you're the up-and-coming power source uh, as far as people in this congregation and in this church. And get a hold of giving at this age. If you can get a hold of giving right now, God is going to do more than you could ever even imagine. Matthew twenty two fifteen. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. This is stating that God is no respecter of persons or that he was not controlled. He was not a hireling. He was not controlled by the mentalities or the money of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou is it lawful to give tribute? This word tribute here is talking about finances or money unto Caesar or not, paying taxes. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. They brought unto him a penny. He saith unto them, Whose is this image? Somebody say image. And superscription. So who's the picture on the coin? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. How did they know it was Caesar's? Because the image. Say image with me. Image. And unto God the things that are God's. How do you know what's God's? Image. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So we see here the fundamental principle, and it is this, that image is attached to ownership. Image is attached to ownership. Image does not exist on its own, but there's something behind an image. There's something behind your image. And I'm going to just talk to you tonight what the Lord dropped in my spirit a little while ago about the essence of image. The essence of image. Would you lay your Bible or your phone down on the chair behind you and would you just lift up your head, lift up your hands, lift up your voice, lift up your hearts. And would you just begin to let those tongues begin to flow. Out of the abundance of your heart, let your mouth begin to pray and speak. Hallelujah. I, I want to do something a little bit unique tonight, and that is I'm just going to talk. I know you've heard me preach. Some of you have heard me teach, but I'm just going to talk about a concept tonight for a little while, and I believe that before I'm finished, that as I'm talking, that there is going to be understanding, that there is going to be revelation that begins to open our eyes to some things and God is going to minister concerning this word, image, tonight. One more time, put your hands together and give God a hand clap of thanksgiving for what he's already doing. Lord, I thank you for your touch. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can be seated tonight. Thank you for engaging in worship in such a wonderful and vibrant way. Here at Lifeline tonight, I want to say it again, image 
is attached to ownership. When the Pharisees came to Jesus and they attempted to entangle him in his words, let me just stop and say that the way I'm going to minister tonight is going to be kind of like, uh, I said this a, a, a week ago or a few days ago at our meeting, I'm just going to talk about a little over here and then we're going to go a little bit over here and then we're just going to go on the canvas and paint a little color over here. But before we leave here tonight, there's going to be a picture and God's going to give us the image of what he wants us to see this evening. And so would you just more than tuning in with your mind, would you open your spirit to the word of the Lord tonight? Now, do you understand what that means? When I ask if you'll open up your spirit to the word of God, it's more than just your mentality. It's more than just understanding what I'm saying, but it's kind of like you're drinking it into to, to your innermost being and you're saying, God, I'm just waiting for a flow to come through your word that's going to begin to sweep into my heart and that's going to begin to affect me. And that's opening up your spirit to the Lord. So why don't you just close your eyes and just begin to open up your spirit to the Lord one more time. Take all the guards down. Take all the concern, all the worries, all the anxiousness. Lay it aside. Just begin to feel after God. Oh, God, I want to lay aside all of the cares of life, all of the thoughts of my day. I want to open up my spirit to you, to your word. That's it. Go ahead as you're praying. Just envision the door of your heart being open. Just imagine that in your mind, the door of your heart being open and just begin to pray and watch as there's a flow that begins to flow through that open door. Mm. So the Pharisees came to Jesus to entangle him in his words, and they said, is it lawful to pay taxes, understanding that the government was corrupt? And Jesus asked them a question. He said, whose image is on the money? The image on a penny is Lincoln, and the image on a quarter is Washington, and it says United States of America, the thing that is on the image signifies what is behind the money or what backs the money. It is the government. It is the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. And so image is attached to ownership. In fact, it's illegal to deface money. You can't rip a dollar bill in half. It's illegal. You're not supposed to put a penny on the railroad tracks, these kinds of things. Uh, I used to take a $5 bill and make Lincoln look like Bill Murray. That was illegal. Image is attached to ownership. He said the face on the coin signifies who owns the coin. You may have the coin in your pocket, but really it is owned by the government or the authoritative power that is the image on the coin. And he was saying in like manner the image that is upon the coin that is your life signifies the ownership of who you are. And so he says, render unto God the things that are God's. You were created in his image and likeness. You are not your own, but you are his. You are bought with a price. You are the church which he purchased with his own blood. And so image is attached to ownership, and image does not exist on its own, but there's always something behind an image. There's a spirit behind an image. There's an authority behind an image. There is something that is pushing that image from the spirit world into reality. When I speak about the essence of image, Let's define that word essence. Essence 
is a property or set of properties or characteristics that make an entity or a substance what it fundamentally is. And so the essence of something is not changeable. If you change the essence of something, then you change the identity of that thing. If you change the molecular structure of a chemical, then it is not that chemical any longer, but it becomes another chemical. If you change or manipulate the DNA of a thing, it becomes a different thing than what it was created. This is what Jesus does when he fills you with the Holy Ghost. He changes the essential characteristics of who you are. This is why the writer says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You were one thing, but now you're a different thing. It changes the DNA of who you are. It changes everything about you. You are now governed by different properties in your life. And so uh, the essence is that unchangeable characteristic of a thing. And so we're talking about the characteristics of an image. The Greek for image is icon. It is an image, a figure, or a likeness. Now, recently Uh, I was ministering somewhere, and my son Levi, my second son, and I had a layover in Las Vegas, and I don't usually like Las Vegas because you get off the plane and you walk into a casino. It's like slot machines all through the airport, and I don't really like all that, that, that atmosphere, but I just felt like Levi and I need to spend a little father son time, and so I extended our layover in Las Vegas for one night, and um I wanted to go see an exhibit. There is in Las Vegas right now a National Geographic exhibit. I don't really do the shows. I definitely don't do the casinos, none of that stuff. I do the good restaurants and the museums. And so we went to uh, the National Geographic rarely seen exhibit in Las Vegas. It was a collection of 50 Images. I think it was exactly 50 images of things rarely seen. Uh, There was an image of a cave, and in the cave, uh, you could see the cave was all lit up, and it just looked like a common cave, but it was a cave that was uh, very deep somewhere in the recesses of the earth that had never been seen with the naked eye of a human. But when they took a camera down there and the flash bulb went off, it took a picture and that picture was the only time that humanity has ever literally seen the inside of that cave. There was uh, a rock outcropping on an island out in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean off of the coast of uh, England somewhere and they had literally carved a church out of that rock outcropping, but it's rarely seen because you got to go up to the North Atlantic, you got to go across the ocean. And so it was an exhibit of images that are rarely seen. To get an image that is rarely seen, there has to be somebody that goes there. There has to be somebody that does the work uh, that, Uh, that goes through the extreme nature of the journey. And to see something that is rarely seen requires a journey that most people will not make. Now, in the spirit world, God speaks to his people many times through images. And there is spiritual vision, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. I'm just talking a little bit about the essential characteristics of Of images. And so uh, Simon Peter went up on the housetop to pray and he had a vision. But in order for Simon Peter to see that vision, then he had to go to the depths to take the journey to see that image or that vision. It required a journey that most people would not make. Uh, It was time to eat. Most people were eating, but Simon Peter went up on the housetop to pray. If you're going to see things in the spirit that are rarely seen, then you're going to have to take journeys that other people are not going to take. 
If you are a scuba, di- scuba diver, it, one, of, some of, one of the allures of being a scuba diver is that you go beneath the surface of the ocean and you see things, you see coral reefs, you see fish, you see different animals and different uh, plants and different, it's, a, it's an entirely different world, it's a different arena. But you can't see the images that you see down there just by walking down Hammer Lane. You've got to go somewhere where nobody else is going. You've got to go deeper. And you have to go down with intentionality. You have to have a desire that says there are images in the world that, that are out there that I want to see that I'm not just satisfied with seeing pictures of. I'm not just satisfied with seeing an exhibit of a preacher coming by and saying, hey, look at the exhibit of all the things I've seen. I saw this in Ethiopia. I saw this in Africa. I saw this in Southern California. I'm not just happy seeing the pictures of the images that other people have seen, but I'm going to take a journey myself, and I'm going to get out of the ankle deep and the knee deep and the loin deep, And I'm going to go into a river that cannot be passed over. And I'm going to scuba dive my way into the depths of the spirit. And I'm going to say, God, open up my eyes and let me begin to see some things that only a few have seen but uh, uh, many have heard about. I want to see the glory of the Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. Until Wilbur and Orville Wright... Uh, began to really make headway with the aircraft, it was not seen a bird's eye view of what the world looked like. And until Neil Armstrong steps out onto the moon in 1969 and takes pictures, there's never been a picture of the earth from the outside looking in. But in order to see things that are rarely seen, then not only do you have to go to depths that people rarely go, but you must ascend to heights that people rarely ascend to. You've got to determine, I'm not just happy with things on earth, but I'm going to sit with him in heavenly places. I'm going to rise. I'm going to get outside of the trappings of time. And I'm going to enter into eternity. I'm not going to be bound by my logic. I'm going to refuse to be bound by the trappings of my thinking. I'm not going to be bound by my brain or by 2020 vision. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. There are things that I can see by day and things that I can see by night. But I want to see those things that I can only see by faith. God has images of things. He has a a picture that he desires to show each of you that's beyond what I could even describe to you. I can stand here and hold you up pictures of 25 and 30 years of ministry of things that I've seen, but I didn't come here just to show you a picture show. I came to impart to you a desire that some young person will get something in their spirit that says if a young John Sanders can get a hold of it. Give me my scuba gear. Put me in the space shuttle. I got to get to a place that I've heard exists, but I've never seen it with my eyes. Mm. There are things in the Holy Ghost, there are things in the Spirit that God wants to show you. You have to be willing to go there. Some of you, God's God sees that that you need a little something to sink your teeth into. You need a little something to, to your, your appetite's strong. And if God doesn't give you something a little bit deeper, then, then you're going you're gonna to allow those appetites to lead you to things that those appetites shouldn't partake of. And so God's wanting to give you something a little bit deeper. And we just had a meeting in Kerman this weekend. Brother Ellis was there. And it wasn't about just, you know, a surface uh, praise or worship meeting. But we were looking for something a little bit deeper. Because there's a young group of people in the earth and in the kingdom of God that they have a, a more 
uh, accessible pathway to deeper darkness than any generation has ever seen before. And you can get up on your phone even while I'm, I'm talking to you right now and you can pull up the depths of depravity and darkness. That's why you got to get your phone locked down. You got to be accountable to somebody and you got to make sure that the images that I'm looking at, that, that these are not images that God did not intend for me to see. Amen. God has some things that he wants you to see, but you can't see what he wants you to see if you're looking at things he never intended for you to see. What I put in front of my eyes in the flesh determines what I see in the spirit. I'm going to say that again. What I put in front of my eyes in the flesh determines what I see in the spirit. I don't want to just settle for seeing earthly things and carnal things. and I don't just want to settle for things in this world. But I long for God to show me some things in that world and to reveal some things and for there to be some revelation. Oh God, open the eyes of your servants that they might see. Mm. Now, if you're going to go deep, you're going to have to go by the rules. I know y'all don't like rules. I don't like rules either. I, th- I was thinking tonight, should I wear a tie? Of course I'm not going to wear a tie. I hate ties. And I thought, well, it's a rule at CLC. you got to wear ties. I thought, you know what? I'm going to break that rule tonight. I'm not wearing a tie. But I got a tie in case I felt like maybe I was getting a little bit out of line and maybe I was letting my... My humanity is uh, get up, so I wanted to make sure that, that I didn't mess anybody up. So I have a tie, but I'm not wearing it because I saw none of you are wearing ties. You see, there's something in me that wants to break the rules. There's something in you that wants to break the rules. Yeah, I know. None of, none of the ladies want to break the rules, but every one of you brothers want to break the rules. I mean... Well, the ladies actually do want to break the rules. They're just different rules. And (laughs) we're not going to start a ladies versus guys situation here. The human nature wants to break the rules. But if you go scuba diving and you break the rules, you die. And you get in a helicopter, go ahead and break the rules. Brother, you're going to crash and burn. And so there are a lot of people who say, well, you don't want to go deep. You don't want to get into the prophetic. You don't want to see these things. Why? Because they've seen person after person after person go higher and deeper and break the rules. But when you have apostolic authority structure in your life and you go abiding to the law and the word of God and you stay within the boundaries of the word, then you can go into some places and you can see some things that you can't see any other way. And so if you want what I'm talking about, then you've got to be submitted. Submitted. Now, did you know there's a step beyond submission? It's agreement. (laughs) Submission is if you disagree. It's if you have two missions. Submission, one mission under another mission. So if I disagree with Brother Ellis and he's my, he's my lifeline pastor, I put my mission under his mission, that's submission. But we still have two missions. That's me humbling myself saying I, I'm going to agree to disagree and I'm going to follow the man of God. But did you know there's a step beyond that and it's agreement. And it only comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. You can submit in your flesh. You can submit just by human decision. You can submit just by logic. But when you get in the unity of the Spirit, there's a bond of peace that comes. And what God wants to take you into is something beyond just submitting to doing things because authority says to do them. But it's getting in the Holy Ghost and allowing the Word of God to begin to recultivate some things in your spirit and to rehabilitate some things in your past and to rejuvenate some things that have died and say, you know what, we're going to bring you back to a place of health to where you're not just submitting to something that you don't even really agree with, but there's an inner agreement in you. When you get to that place of inner agreement, God's going to take you higher and God's going to take you deeper than you could ever go if you're just walking around agreeing to disagree all the time. 
And so we must go to a level beyond submission to agreement if we want to see the things that God wants us to see. Now, concerning vision and seeing the things of the Spirit in the Old Testament, uh, they saw things different than we see in the New Testament or particularly in the age of the Spirit. I don't just want to say the New Testament because some of the New Testament's under the Old Covenant. And so we're talking about the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. And so in, under the Old Covenant, the Bible talking about prophetic vision says that the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. The NLT says, meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. So they didn't see these images from God often. Let me explain to you the difference between the prophetic vision that guys like Samuel and Eli experienced in the Old Testament and the prophetic vision that you and I, all of us, were part of a prophetic community, which is the church, were the fulfillment of what Moses declared when he said, I would that all of God's people prophesy. Prophetic vision in the New Testament is markedly different than what prophetic vision was in the Old Testament. So we see images different now than they saw images then. And let me describe it to you in kind of maybe a technology kind of way because you're a technology generation. Does anybody know what a Polaroid camera is? So a Polaroid camera, you take a camera. It's not connected to a phone. It's only a camera. And then you click the camera, and then it spits out an image. And then you go like this, because it takes a little air to develop that image. And within just a few moments, that image becomes clear. That image is a still image. That image doesn't move. That image is something that is set on that piece of paper. This is what that Old Testament vision was looking like. God would give Samuel a vision or he would give one of them a vision and it would just be a, a, almost like a snapshot. It was like it was frozen in time. He would show them something that was so undeniably clear that if they lied and said God said something else, then the penalty might be death. But in the New Testament, the Bible says... That except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This means that when you are born again, then your spiritual eyes are open and you begin to see the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is not a still image. The kingdom of God is not just a picture of a sandcastle. It's not just a picture of a church built on a rock off the coast of England somewhere. The kingdom of God is not rarely seen, but it's only seen through spiritually illuminated and enlightened eyes. And so when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you begin to see things that you've never seen before. You begin to have dreams and visions that come from God in a regular, in a regular pace. You go to prayer and God will show you things in your mind's eye. And it's not as clear as a Polaroid picture. Sometimes it's more like a moving picture. It's, like, it's, a, it's almost sometimes like a movie or a flow because the things of the kingdom flow. And so the flow of that river or the flow of that spirit will bring things as they begin to drift through your mind as you're beginning to pray. And so in the New Testament, the way that we get vision is markedly different than it was in the Old Testament. This is why it says one prophesy and another judge. Because we are not infallible. I might see something and think I know exactly what I saw, but somebody else might see it from a different and more correct perspective. But there's a little bit of a margin of error for humanity. That's why we need the body of Christ. We need elders. That's why I need Brother Geisler in the house tonight. Because if I speak something that's a little incorrect or a little improper, because I am vocally telling you the things that I am visually seeing while I'm preaching. I need another man of God with spiritual vision and a little experience that says, I know what you were saying you saw and I see where you were coming from, but here's a little clearer picture of what you really saw. 
And so if we're going to see things that are rarely seen, we need elders, we need authority, we need a, the five-fold ministry, we need a pastoral structure in our life. You can't just flow in the Holy Ghost and see images all the time and be completely disconnected from the church, from the ministry, or what you are is you're disconnected from the kingdom. You're trying to see kingdom vision, but you're trying to do it without the rule book and and you're going to die in your scuba gear or you're going to crash your plane. But when you get within the boundaries of what God is doing, then God will show you things that you've never seen before. And so, most of the things that we see in the Spirit um, require human interpretation. And the way that we interpret what we see and we feel is through a principle that we find in 1 Corinthians 14, 13. Pray that you may interpret. Now when we have tongues and interpretation, what do you do? You pray that you may interpret. But this, this instruction to pray that you may interpret applies to all spiritual communication that requires interpretation. The Bible says that no scripture is of any private interpretation. How do you interpret scripture? You pray that you may interpret. How do you interpret a dream? You pray that you may interpret talks about the interpretation of the Proverbs. How do you interpret a proverb and what it means? You pray that you may interpret. And so this is the fundamental principle, 1 Corinthians 14, 13, about how to handle the vision that God gives us when he gives us vision or understanding in the kingdom of God. Now, let me just... Let me just flip somebody's switch in somebody's brain and get you, your brain thinking. Did you know there's more than one God in the Bible? <laughs> I preached it last time I was here. The God, Deuteronomy says he's the God, big G, God of gods. Some of y'all are like, man, we better get Brother Sanders off campus. Brother Haney hears this. There are many gods, little g gods. The, the Hebrew word is Elohim in Scripture. But there's only one God that is worthy of our worship in Scripture. However, biblically, there are many gods. Genesis 3 and all right, I guess i got to go to the Bible. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. And so these gods, these little g gods, are heavenly beings that understand the difference between good and evil. Genesis 31.30 Laban asked Jacob why he had stolen his gods. Little g gods. What were these gods? They were images. Lots of gods, lots of images. And so we're talking about the essence of an image. What's behind an image? There's something behind it. These gods, little g gods, were images which Laban worshipped. We see it in Genesis 31, 34. And so these heavenly beings, which are fallen spirits, are lesser gods that are represented by human hands with images. And so Buddha is a little g god represented with an image. And Hinduism teaches that there are all kinds of gods. We have Indian people come to our church in Karma every week that are Hindu and Sikh, and they worship God. Is they think that Jesus is the God of America. 
I think he's the God of America too, but he's more than the God of America. He's the God of India too. But they just think he's a God among other gods. They don't realize that he's not just the Elohim. But in Deuteronomy, it says he's the big G God of gods. That big G God in the Hebrew is literally Elohim, Elohim. He's the Elohim, Elohim of all the Elohims. He's the God under whose direction all these other spirits or lesser gods are allowed to operate. And so gods in the earth project images. Daniel 3.14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? And so Nebuchadnezzar's asking them, Why don't you worship my gods that are projecting images? Psalm 135, 15, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them, this is talking about the people that make the idol or the image or the picture, they that make them are like unto them. Think about that. Anybody ever been driving through Oakland or downtown Stockton and you see a demonic mural on the side of a building? It's an image. You know what's behind the image? A God. A a demonic force. A fallen spiritual being. But our God is the God of That's greater than all those gods. But the Bible says that the makers of those images, hear it, it says it right here. It says, they that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. And so the people that paint those murals act like or take on the essential characteristics of the dark spirits that are behind those images. This is why the enemy dominates the art world and dominates Hollywood and dominates the online arena. Why? Because they are mediums through which he can portray images. A spirit produces an image. You see somebody's tattoos and it looks like a demon or something. It's a spirit produced image on somebody's body, which was intended to be what? The image of God. And so it's the enemy from the spirit world working through a tattoo artist to deface something that was meant to be the image of God. Now, I'm not bashing anybody who has tattoos. I'm saying don't get any after you get the Holy Ghost. But if you got them before you got the Holy Ghost, they're covered with the blood. You might see them in the mirror, but when Jesus looks down at you, he sees you as being whiter than snow. Not only that, but when, when you're baptized in Jesus' name and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, those tattoos become a testimony. You don't take pride in them, but what you can do is instead of looking in the mirror in condemnation, saying, I, I, I'm just exhibiting all the images of the spirits uh, that were attacking me. No, no, no. You look in the mirror and say, I'm created, I'm recreated, I'm a new creature in the image of God. And that's a testimony of where Jesus brought me from. Look what the Lord has done. image exists in the spirit world 
Hear me. Image exists in the spirit world and is projected into the natural world. I can prove it to you biblically. Image exists in the spirit world and is projected into the natural world. And so a false spirit produces an image in the natural world made by men's hands. But the one true God produced an image in the natural world not made by the hands of man. Daniel 2.31, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image, his head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And so Nebuchadnezzar, from the visual of an image in the spirit world that he saw in a dream, produces an image in the natural world, a gold image. He's kind of like he's thumbing his nose at God, saying, well, you said that there are going to be different metals that represent different ages, but my kingdom's going to be living forever. I'm not just the gold head, but I'm going to make a 66-foot tall image that's going to have a whole gold body. He was saying to God, you're not the God that has an eternal kingdom, but I'm going to be the king that has an eternal kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar would produce a gold image 66 feet tall that he saw in his dream. This image had consisted of various layers of earthly elements. And the image at every layer represented a kingdom, a king, and a prince. The first layer, the head, represented the Babylonian kingdom, King Nebuchadnezzar, and the principalities or powers of Babylon. The second was, was the Persian, Medo-Persian kingdom, King Darius and the Persian kings, and the prince of Persia, which Daniel would war against in prayer all the way in Daniel 10. And then it says when he was praying, the prince of Grecia came. It was referencing a time that was coming that was represented by the next layer of metals in that, in, that, in that image that Nebuchadnezzar would see. It was the Greek kingdom. It was Alexander the Great and the successive kings of Greece and the prince of Grecia. And then he saw legs of iron. It was the Roman kingdom. It was the Caesars. And it was the prince of Rome and the spirits of Antichrist that were there during the time that Jesus came into the world. And then he saw the divided kingdoms. These are the various kings and presidents in the world. And he saw the principalities of these kingdoms. But finally, Daniel said, that wasn't I all that I saw of the image. I saw of the... I, after I saw the image that was made with hands, inspired by the spirits of each kingdom, I saw a final image, and it was of a kingdom that was a stone cut out of a mountain. Hear it, without hands. This image of all the world kingdoms could be made with hands, but the image of the coming kingdom was an image that couldn't be made with hands. It was the image that was, that it was a God whose image was not made with hands. And so Paul would later stand at Mars Hill and say, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands. That's why when you walk into a cathedral, they might have an image of Peter, it's made with hands. You don't worship that image. They might have an image of Mary, it's made with hands. You don't worship that image. 
And when you walk into the Staples Center, you might see a big man that's a basketball player that it says the chosen one on the on his back tattooed, an image tattooed on a man that was meant to be in the image of God, but he's not the chosen one. He's an idol made with hands and the minds of men, but the anointed one is Jesus Christ who was begotten when the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And so the images that you see on the internet and in Hollywood and in churches and temples and cathedrals, these are images that have been, that have been inspired by gods of this world and made with men's hands who have channeled and who have become conductors of spirits. But the image of the one true living God, not made with hands, was Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 and 3 calls Jesus Christ the ex- expressed image. To express something means to push something out. It's to take it from the spirit world and manifest it in the natural world. It says that he is the expressed image or the manifested image from the spirit world into the natural world of God's person. Did you hear it? It didn't say persons. Hebrews 1.3 is one of the greatest one God scriptures in all of your Bible. It says that he's the expressed image of God's person. The Apostles' Creed will tell you that God is three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, but Hebrews 1 and 3 says that God is one person and the divine spirit that is the Elohim, Elohim pushed an image into the world. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so God is a singular person. And he has a singular personality. He has been mimicked and copied by the principalities and the fallen spirits of earth. And they have tried to counterfeit images that will distract you from worshiping the image of the one true living God. They have produced images that men worship. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Colossians 1.15, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell Jesus Christ is the image of the one God of all gods Deuteronomy 10, 17, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great and a mighty and a terrible which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. It's saying he's the Elohim, Elohim. And so I said all that to say to a generation that's completely bound by images. That there are spirits behind those images. Those images are counterfeit attempts to be what God is. The enemy always tries to counterfeit. And he tries to take you from from being in grace to being back under the law. So under the law and the the temple, they would offer up incense unto God. And so he'll give you plants. And he'll pull you back into an old world. And he'll say, now smoke it. And as you're smoking weed... You're offering up incense to other gods. 
And he'll pull you back into that world of the law and the sacrifices and say, grace doesn't work here. And he'll say, I want you to pour out a drink offering. And so he'll put alcohol in your hands. There's a reason why they call it spirits, because there's something behind it all. And when you partake of that stuff, you are literally pouring out a drink offering to little G gods as a counterfeit act of worship of images that you were never intended to worship. That's why you begin to take LSD and you begin to smoke mushrooms. You begin to have these hallucinogenic trips and you begin to see images that you can't see in other ways and you begin to see things that God never intended for you to see. Why? It's because other gods in that in that fallen world of the spirit, in that subterranean world of darkness are projecting or they are expressing their image and you have gained access to those images by unauthorized means. You have gained access to those you're not seeing the kingdom but you're seeing that kingdom. You're seeing another kingdom. You're seeing a counterfeit kingdom. God never intended for you to interact with that kingdom. That's a work of the flesh. That's witchcraft. That Ouija board will show you something but it's not the kingdom God meant you to see. That demonic dream that comes from what you've been enraptured in online. It'll show you something, but it's not the kingdom that God intended for you to see. There is a kingdom uh, that is like a stone hewn out of the mountain. It's an image not made with hands. It's not made with men, uh, but it's only seen when you get in heavenly places and you say, I'm going to put on my scuba deer. I'm going to get in heavenly places. I'm going to rise. But it's easier to see things rarely seen when you're smoking weed than it is when you're crucifying your flesh and you're praying in the Holy Ghost. And it's easier to see things rarely seen when you're drunk and you're out of your mind and you're laying on the floor and you got dirty shag carpet under your head and you got vomit next to you from somebody that you thought was a friend. What you're doing, you're getting in hellish places. You're not getting in heavenly places. You thought that you were getting high, but you're really going low. You're seeing things God never intended for you to see. And tonight, God sent me by here to tell you that it's time to put all that witchcraft under your feet and put the works of the foot. A sexual relationship between a man and a woman is typology of intimacy between Christ and the church. It's the sign of a relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. And so the enemy tries to defile that image through pornography. And idolatry is spiritual adultery. It's cheating on the bridegroom with other gods. But God never intended for you to have a relationship uh, that was polyamorous uh, or that was polygamous. Uh, He meant for the bride uh, to be a bride that is without spot uh, or wrinkle uh, or blemish. This is imagery that he's talking about. He's saying, I'm coming back for a pure bride. And so if you leave here tonight and you go back to that dorm room or you go to your mom and daddy's house or you go to that apartment and you open up that phone and you begin to look at pornography, you are literally worshiping images. You are worshiping the gods that are portraying images. They're expressing images from that from that world, from that dark world, from that deep world into the natural world to try to disrupt you out of the church.
church and to try to disrupt you out of prayer and to try to corrupt you from being who God created you to be. And it messes up your image. Let me just tell you something. You can be seated. I got to say this at Christian Life Center and Christian Life College. The Bible says in Jude, talking about these filthy dreamers, these filthy people. What do you get in a dream? Images. And they're acting out in the natural world, the images that they see in the spirit world. And it says, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. I'm about to make some folks a little bit uncomfortable here. Because maybe you never heard it taught. But that word defile there is mieno. In the English transliteration, it's M-I-A-I-N-O. It means to die or stain the flesh. And so dyeing the hair, any color, not just a natural color, is defiling the flesh. And it is the projection of a spirit from that world into this world. Coloring the nails is defiling the flesh. And it is a projection from that world into this world. Makeup, powder, base, even if it's your natural skin color, it's not of God. You're defacing the image. And what's on the image represents ownership. And so who owns you? Kim Kardashian uses that color. And so now you use that color. And so the spirit behind Kim's image, and she's channeling it, she becomes like that spirit. And then it projects onto your image, young lady. You're telling God, God, you didn't do well enough. Uh, you're not as good of a God as the gods that are behind this image. Can I talk about this at CLC or y'all going to run me out on a rail? I'm telling some young lady tonight that it's time to put away the makeup and stop defiling the image and let your face show the glory of the God that created you. Oh my God, I feel the Holy Ghost witness in this house. I believe that there is divine deliverance. I believe that somebody's going to get lifted out of your bondage. Somebody's going to get released by the image problems that you've been facing. You've been worried about your self-image. You've been thinking, I don't look good enough. That's a spirit lying to you that's saying, I'm better looking than your God. You need to look like that demonic spirit and not like the king of kings, but you need to rise up and say, I'm not dying. I'm not cutting. I'm not manipulating. I'm not painting. I'm not defiling the flesh anymore. And when you do it, you're worshiping that God. But when you don't, you're worshiping that God. You hear me, young men? I pastor married men. I pastor married couples. And I'll watch as they begin to struggle. 
and the wife will begin to start wearing light makeup and she'll start dyeing her hair, doing whatever it is she's doing. And it's almost always an indicator that subconsciously she feels like she's competing with something or somebody. And so when it happens in the woman and she starts trying to manipulate and change her image, I realize that she doesn't realize it, but she's fighting against all the images of women that that man's looking at on his phone. And so there is competition that has entered into the marriage. And so the man's on pornography and the woman's clipping and cutting and wanting to get plastic surgery and painting and dying. But we don't just need our ladies to rise up and say we're not going to do that. But we need our men to declare I will set no evil thing in front of my eyes. I'm not just teaching, but this is spiritual warfare. I'm speaking flat-footed to spirits that have risen up against this church for generations. I'm telling you right now that you've got the authority to draw a line in the sand and say we're not living that way, we're not doing that thing, we're not acting in that manner, but we're going to rise up. We're going to be a holy bride. We're going to be a godly bride. Come on, honey, if you believe it, these altars are open. Come on, brother, if you believe it, come on up here and get you some of the God that I'm preaching. That is the Elohim, Elohim. He is the God of all other gods. Something just broke at Christian Life College. Something just broke in Lifeline. Something just broke because divine revelation began to sweep into this house and you begin to recognize, oh God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be doing that. I didn't mean to be worshiping that. Go ahead. You're waiting for me to go further. I'm done. It's decision making time. It's decision making time. As for me and my house. As for me and my family. Go ahead, go on back to the dorm room and throw that junk in the trash. Go ahead, brothers. Go on up to Brother Ellis and say, Brother Ellis, I need you to put locks on my phone. I don't want my phone to be an altar to untrue gods. I don't want my phone to be an altar where I'm offering up worship to any god rather than Jesus, who is the expressed 